Yeah. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunset Planning Commission and to thank Ken and SCTV for filming. And uh, I'd like uh, Rich Cordes to serve for uh, Kevin today. Sure. Um, First order of business is application 15-01 of Robin Messier Pearson Esquire for K and K Developers Inc. Agent Infinity 4 LLC owners requesting subdivision of the property located at 34 Hotline Street, map E18, block 117, <coughs> lot 001, to create three lots, zone CAD, received 3-10-2015. And the decision must be rendered by uh, 514 this year. Uh, good evening. Um, happy to be the only applicant on the agenda, so we won't be here till midnight. Too bad. Um, so, as you may recall, I'm Chris Ferrero from Plus O'Neill, representing the applicant. Um, a number of months ago, we went through a, a process here in Simsbury changing uh, the site to a PAD, PAD uh, zone. And as part of that application process, a fairly detailed master plan uh, and evaluation by all the boards and commissions in Simsbury was required. Uh, this board, obviously, we met with you two or three times to iron out a number of issues that we hope we were successful in uh, doing. So we're here on a fairly simple matter this evening with respect to, I think, planning board's requirement, statutory requirement, and that is as the approver of a subdivision of land. So as we presented to you during the PAD application process, currently we have two pieces of land, the southern piece and the northern piece. What we intend to do, as we intended to do as part of that original presentation and application for the zone change, is we tend to construct the residential component of the overall master plan first, which we are doing, and in order to do that, we were going to, we suggested then and we're verifying and vetting now, <coughs> that this southern piece be divided into three separate parcels. The, again, the property lines, this is the original plan, this is the original property lines that were drawn up to suggest where that subdivision of land might be as part of that process. So, residential component down here, by default, since Garden Homes will own that access way in fee simple, that by default creates two additional lots, which means we have a three lot subdivision. And we're here tonight in front of the planning board to get gain approval for that three lot subdivision. Now, as part of the process that during the zone change application, we talked about a lot of things, um, many of probably are which, uh, of which are not necessarily germane to, to tonight's application. <coughs> we talked about open space and the percentage of open space that we were providing, 39% across the entire site. And the PAD application is clear that it does look at the entire site. It doesn't look at a single project within that entire site. So this subdivision of land is not necessarily the single action upon which this entire PAD program gets built out. There'll be additional actions. There'll be additional site plan approvals. There's potentially another subdivision of land <coughs> at some point in time. Um, so this is the first of, we hope, to be a number of actions and, again, we're seeking subdivision approval. So, um, not to belabor the point, but the lines are literally within a tenth of an acre of what we had assumed, where we assumed we were going to be during the master plan process. We hit, pretty much hit it on the mark. And we've done enough engineering now of this site plan to, to understand that it's real, it works, it works like we designed it in the master plan phase, and therefore there isn't really substantive changes to the property lines associated you know, between what we're proposing now and what we propose to you as part of the master plan process. And lastly, to keep this brief, um, this is basically the, the base of the engineered plan. So again, it's almost identical to what we designed as part of that master plan. And that's really, I think, the level of detail I need to get into unless you have additional questions. So the traffic information, obviously, is just on the residential component. The There's traffic the, information. The traffic study that was, that was... That was reviewed as part of the zone change application? Well, it was submitted with the stuff we got tonight. So the traffic information is just the residential. I believe Correct. so. And that, that has to be submitted. That's close to OSA. Anytime there's more than 25 yep. living. So that's the 
that's that's here. You no, know, the threshold is much greater than that, but it's 200 parking spaces. Well, I thought I read in the regulations that it was 25. No. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, so until there's some kind of application for the commercial portion of this, we don't know about traffic. We'll never we do to the extent that we have submitted a complete traffic study on the entire proposal. Okay. That and I that included the current? Yes. Okay. That's where my question is. Right. Yes. Okay. Chris, the uh, open space percentage you quoted, is that just for the southern portion you're talking about and not the northern? <clears throat> it's the 39 percent is for the entire 60 acres. How much of that is on the southern and how much on the northern? Um, again, our previous site plans identified a lot of that. Um, we can achieve without finding the numbers. <coughs> now, depending on how you define open space, which you can define open space a lot of different ways, the way we defined it, these three parcels would total uh, open space. So parcel 1A, 1B, 1C is three, five, six, seven, is about 10, about 10 acres, which would exceed the 20% that's required, if you were to break it down, which I'm not sure that would take And as open space, we're considering everything between the buildings? Well, that 39% considers open space that is usable by the public. So you're talking about the space in between buildings, residential buildings there? Yeah, could be. That's not what I consider that space. <clears throat> Herm, do you have any comments? No, it's pretty straightforward. It's the same, same plan, essentially, as Chris said. It's the same plan that we saw through the PAD. Uh, this is only for one part of it. We do expect that sometime in the future we will see applications for the front parts as well uh, but there is a, a portion of the uh, open space that's shown for the entire property that's part of this subdivision that's shown there as well as was the same same as was originally shown as well I just I just actually found some data too that hopefully will ease your mind <coughs> so <coughs> on the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> on the 23 or so acres that we have here the 20 percent is achieved with basically this, 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 and this. Nothing between buildings. Thank you. Questions? Um, I, I have a comment, Chris. Um, a lot of the uh, PAD-related uh, applications that we see tend to concentrate on the residential portion of the, uh, of the application. And <clears throat> from what I can see here, uh, it looks like the first phase of the development will be the residential. Correct. Um, are there any plans to uh, see some commercial development in, in the near future? Uh, we, I mean, we have the property owner's attorney here. He might or might not want to speak to that. We haven't heard any specific uh, interest in that property, but we might not be the right source for that information anyway. We did testify as part of the, in our marketing folks testified as part of the PAD application that we call this sort of a catalyst project. <coughs> so if you've got multiple uses, you need something to get over the inertia of, and this potentially 181 units gets over that inertia. And we all think it will help the chances of that, those front pieces greatly. <coughs> For the record, TJ Dunny, who I represent, Mark Greenberg, Infinity 4 LLC, who is the owner of the 60 acres. Uh, which is the entire subject of the PAD. We are actively in discussions with real estate professionals about uh, uses that might go there, and there have been many identified, but we don't feel that we'll have anything locked in or started until, until the garden homes permits are locked in tight, which you're doing now, and which will be done within six weeks from now. Then we'll have final, final permits for that. And we believe that some people will rely on that and they move forward with some stuff. It's a great spot. We're on TV. We'd love to have anybody's interest <laughs> in <it. laughs> <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<coughs> with a PID, if the market, nothing happens on the north portion, could that considerably turn to residential? Or when you go for a PID, it's a higher question. You know? No, it's really it locked has in. To, it has to be what's it's what we're being told to. was previously approved by the commission. Any changes to that would come back to the commission, not only this commission, but also the zoning commission as well. Any change in those uses? I'm just looking at the traffic study that was submitted with this. And <coughs> my look at it looks to me like it only applies to the residential component. Okay. But the traffic study that we submitted as part of the PAD applies to the entire right. 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 And it makes sense that that traffic study um, looks at this residential component only because when it goes to OSTA, that's the traffic study that will go to OSTA, OSTA is going to evaluate any additional off-site impact improvements predicated on what's being built. So each time something gets developed, they're going to have to submit an, aug or an augment or submit a new traffic study that get basically gets compounded on, this, on the, SDC, the OSTA certificate. Compounded. In other words, you will have this, yeah. the oh. next, then you have this, gets yeah, added it, to it, then you have that, gets okay. added to it. Okay. Any other questions, or Chris? Yeah, I, you say essentially the same, we're talking about the master plan. What have you changed, you know, going line for line? I mean, have you changed anything in the master plan that we approved before, or yeah. you know, have we tweaked a building or two? Yeah, or, uh, yeah. Really yeah, 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 at that level we have, <laughs> definitely. Um, we tweaked little parking areas. We sort of made these a little bit bigger. We made the walkways uh, so that they relate more to the front door. Before, they were really just shapes of open space. We didn't know what they were going to be. But it's literally that level of, of detail. We have the same number of parking spaces. We've added some garages. Or, well, actually, no. We had carports before. So that's the level of detail that we changed. Very, very minimal. I think they were they were relocated, Chris, right? They were relocated from where they were before. OK. Yeah. Right to the perimeter. That was some of the things we talked so about push before. The, are they carports or garages? I mean, they're actually garages now. There are garages now, and yeah. we, do we approve carports or car okay. Yeah. And we relocated in some of them based on uh, staff comments, frankly. Okay. And they're all still rentals? Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Looks like you lost the building on the my left-hand side, where the, you did the little parking thing. Uh, where? Right there. Okay, this, again, predicated on some staff comments and through the, through the commission process, this was a series of these. Basically, the recommendation was, we'll get rid of those there, just put another two-story, smaller building there, and have that as the only townhouse area. And we reconfigured this a little bit. I think it might have been four smaller buildings before, now it's three. But the roof heights haven't changed. You know, we locked into that, that view shed analysis, and we're still sticking with all of that.
second part of the, the rear portion of the property has proposed building for 14 units in, in one of the buildings and 17 units in the other. Those are new buildings and the construction obviously will be different than it will be for the rehabilitation of the uh, existing Webster, former Webster Bank building. What the applicant is proposing to do, and just sort of, this is not a subdivision, uh, what the applicant is proposing to do is simply draw a property line that you see on the map that I, that I just gave you uh, to essentially divide the project into two parts. Because they're two very different parts and two sort of very different skills and two very different financing packages, uh, the applicant came in a while ago and said, you know, we need to do this in order to get this project moving forward. Um, so this map was drawn uh, by the surveyor and submitted. It does, in fact, we did an analysis of it. It does, in fact, meet all the requirements uh, for the uh, town center code area for each of the lots. One of the things that I, well, there are a lot of things about this that I think are important, but one of the things I think is really important is that the, the front lawn that uh, has been basically preserved as part of this uh, proposal is proposed to remain uh, that way as well. There's nothing proposed there. It's essentially uh, remain front lawn, and that's important. We did discover uh, not long ago that there is sort of already an easement on that, actually, that was done some time ago to, to remain as front lawn. So that will stay exactly as it's shown on this plan. So the only thing I'm here to do tonight is to try to explain that to you, answer whatever questions you might have. The, uh, the owner of the property is here as well. If you have other questions that I can't answer, so I'm happy to do that. But this is, kind of, this is a lot split, not a subdivision. First time it's been cut in many, many, many years before it was, when it was created. Um, and so that's basically it. And any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. What's the difference between a lot split and a subdivision? Subdivision is actually division of property into three parcels. And those um, have, uh, they're under the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. A lot split is the first cut of the property, where the property is divided into one, two parcels, and an applicant, a, an over, owner of a property, is entitled to do that one time without coming to the Commission for approval. Uh, they thought it would be a good idea because this is the first significant piece of property that's being developed in the town center to just kind of let the commission know what's happening and why and to try to answer whatever questions you might have with regard to it. Pretty straightforward. Um, but again, when I first saw it, I, I, I had some questions and we sat down, I think, for probably about 90 minutes or so and talked a little bit about the different uh, types of, of uh, skills that are involved in each of these projects. One, uh, sort of a restoration of an existing landmark structure and the other uh, new construction, which is totally different. So they'll probably be done by two different um, individuals, two different firms um, with different sets of expertise. But the way the lines have been drawn allows them to sort of function on their own and function individually, although um, I'm sure that the, the cross, means, cross easements between the properties will allow people to drive in the driveway and park where they need to park without any problems from other folks. So, so non-subdivision means no open space, nothing, nothing to do with open space or any of the statutes? The, the PAD was originally uh, approved for the property and uh, the Conservation Commission was pretty adamant about um, development within a certain certain area of the, uh, the steep slopes to the south. There's a wetland pro property over there. The open space that's uh, proposed is in a proposed area will stay as open space, and the applicant and the owner could, could address that if you like. Uh, is the front lawn and is scheduled to stay that way. Uh, I did see some sketches at one time which uh, had a, a sort of a, one of the, the rear property uh, come out to Hot Meadow Street, which I think was a good idea for a lot of reasons. One is 
um, the indication there is that sometime in the future, 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the road, somebody might want to put a driveway in from Hot Meadow to the rear of that property rather than go around the, the Drake Hill and go down that way. So this way it's divided that the lawn will remain as open space, uh, essentially as it is. Uh, they talked about the possibility of putting some, some gardens in there or a fountain or something, but something will be totally compatible with what's there currently now. But it does not include any direct access to Hot Meadow Street, which I thought was a, a good idea. Are we talking about underground parking for the 17-unit uh, building? Not underground parking. It's in the building. It's, it's under the building. Yeah, but not underground. Okay. But, yeah, under but that's where they're so coming up like, with the extra parking spaces. It's like one less street. Yes, in a way. Yeah. 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 Hey, just out of curiosity, then, they, how far back the proposed 14 units of that, does that go back as far as where they used to be EV garages, or is it further up? No, there's a wall there. Yeah. There's actually a, a fairly uh, high wall, of six, eight feet, maybe more in some cases, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes back to there. That's as far as it'll go. Has this always been proposed as an L-shaped building? It seems to me I saw something earlier where there was some space between the two buildings. Was that because the, of the wetland? No, well, that's exactly right, Alan. What happened was that the, the, the number of units um, changed and the buildings were reconfigured based upon the fact that they had to pull back from the wetlands. The wetlands agency was very uh, adamant about the fact that they didn't want the, the, that end of the building uh, any closer to the wetlands than it was than it's proposed here. And so when the building was pulled back, they changed the end, the Hot Meadow end of the configuration. It did two things. One is it sort of softened that look from Hot Meadow Street. Mm -hmm. And you may recall that from looking at some of the uh, photo simulations, that when the landscaping is in, you almost can't see that end of the building. But it was pulled back and sort of reconfigured again that way. And when they did that, they did in fact bring the two buildings closer together. There is technically a, a closed separation, a closed stair between the two buildings. You see that. And so that would allow people to get from the upper level down the stair to the dumpster area in the back, you know, to go to the, to there. They could, in, in fact, go to the rear of, of the building, whether they were going to go to somebody else's garage or a different portion of the property or walk down the driveway or whatever. But, but that stair would allow communication between the upper and the lower levels. Still, though, it's kind of a closed system. Well, that's the way it is. yeah. Well, it's, it's covered, you know, in a way, and, and so when you get a winter and stairs get covered with snow, it's probably safer to have them covered than not covered. You said the uh, number but, of units. I'm sorry. But will we'll, we'll change also, to go up or down? There were ultimately there were three units added, and the zoning commission looked at that and asked questions about that. The design review looked at it as well, um, asked questions about it. What it did allow was for uh, an increased amount of. Uh, covered parking in the back of that building as you come around that the lower level mm -hmm. there's covered parking in that area that area was open before so when the building was brought back in that direction and correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. but I think that uh, what happened there were probably about six additional parking spaces created allowed to be created back there when the building sort of slid to the rear slightly so basically we're talking like a parking garage underneath a massive parking garage not individual I mean there'll be numbered for each individual unit, but it will be basically an open garage area underneath. Yeah, Jake, you want to talk? I can only assume that considering the access in <coughs> is one way, so it has to be for everyone a parking garage to get in and out of there. I think it's, it's wide enough for two in, a, in the end. Yeah, you know, the topography goes from west to east, so it, mm -hmm. it uh, slopes off toward the railroad tracks down there. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're using that grade, or a little lower than what's there, and we're going to build the garages, and then hopefully it's a cut and fill and a balanced site, and we'll pile the rest of it on to make it at grade so you can walk in your unit. Correct. Yeah. So the underneath street. the building will be basically a parking garage. Yeah, yeah. And it will be open to the back side, no doubt. Yes. Toward the wetlands or toward that back or, east yeah, side. Toward the, yeah, the east side, the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. The active deer trail actually. Yes, it's a significant wetland down there on the <laughs> property. Which I'm going through a lot. So when I was there, it was a, a six point buck walking through there. Will both units have that uh, parking arrangement? <coughs> no, the, um, the, the south building will have a little bit of underbuilding parking on the east side. The south side will have the underneath. The east side will have individual garages, from what it looks like here on the on the uh, 
Yeah, on the drive. If you're facing the wall, that's the east. The east building has the under building. South building will just have a little bit on the east side. Just to, I have to show you the drawing. In the southeast corner. Yes. This is all of this. And these are the garage. So if you're oriented just like this, this is the east. Right, so this will all be under building. And yes, and you'll have a little bit under here. This well, isn't going to no, this no, no, not all the way, just a little portion right there. Just a small You're going to get all these people parking here? No. Nope. Where are they going to park? Listen, our garage. Okay, you have all this is surface parking. We've got garages right here. What about for these people? Where are they parking? <coughs> yeah, not, not everybody is going to get a garage. I think we're going to walk to Fitzgerald's and. So right only lines. this is parking right here? Mm -hmm. Oh, I was assuming that yeah, this, all, everything underneath here would be parking. Yeah, just there's there's grand trees right here, <coughs> and there's roots, and we're afraid of disrupting huh. that. Just out of curiosity, I had a question about, uh, it's not our, sorry, just the cosmetics of the outside of the building, how it matches the house, just my being curious. <coughs> It will it will complement, but it will not look the same. And that was really the direction from um, uh, Julie Carmichael, represents state and federal tax credits. Oh, for the historic. They they do not want it to look like it had been there forever. I'm not going to let you use fake brown stuff. Well, we're we're going to have we'll have a little bit of that, some accents to complement them, but it's uh, primarily exterior will be the cementitious board and shingle roofs. Whereas the mansion is entirely yeah. redstone. Yeah. So they'd rather have it complement but different. They they don't yeah. want it to look like it they don't want it to detract from this being the iconic <coughs> building. And frankly we don't either. So we're what's the height compared to the existing building? How how high are the new units? Are they lower than yeah. the peak because of the, the grade? Peak, yeah, the peak will end up being lower. Townhouses? Up down? The townhouses will be right. And they're all townhouses? Well, the lower levels are flats. First level is are flats, and then we have two story townhomes above that. How many stories are we talking about here? It's two and a half story. Two and a half story, three stories? Yeah, two and a half, just like the existing building. I think that's all that code allows was two and a half. We initially had three, but we had to throw them back. Iron, this is just a discussion, not a formal application. Yeah, just this discussion and actually the discussion is just on the lot split. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, so we can't move again. A, I think we have an interesting buyer. Let's, let's, let's keep asking your question. <laughs> um, could, could you explain to me the benefit of doing the lot split? Well, there's a, first of all, if we don't, SHPO weighs in on what the design of the new build will be. Uh, secondly, it's probably different skill sets. One is going to, uh, one group of contractors is going to be uh, more more uh, inclined for a, a, a historical restoration, and some contractors we talk to don't want to touch the mansion. They want to do the new build. Well, what uh, does the lot line have to do with that? It's going to be separate contracts. It's going to be separate financing, and it'll be separate investors. Okay. Yeah. So that's the point. Same owner, though. Same owner. Yeah. Same owner. Yeah. For the time being. And yeah. If, and if, anyone can sell a lot. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And if yeah. B, if parcel B, let's call it the new build, if that becomes condominium based on demand, then at some point the condominium association will be the owner of that property, but the front lawn and the mansion will be preserved. Basically, it's all about finance. Yeah. yeah. And future ownership. And practice, and construction management. Yeah, because but of the the only. uniqueness of a historic rehab versus a mm -hmm. new build. <coughs> Any other comments? Break a leg. It's exciting for downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
a couple of things that I wanted to bring to the Commission's attention under updates and status of ongoing matters. Uh, I just gave you a copy of the uh, CIP plan program, uh, which the Board of Selectmen Engineering Department uh, is referring to you for your consideration. There is no formal language yet, uh, but what we wanted to do is get this to you so you had an idea of what it was. As soon as the formal, you know, the bond council's language is prepared, uh, we'll get that to you for your consideration. But what I wanted to do was, to, at least tonight, to, to get this in your hands, make sure that you had an opportunity to look at it before you were being asked to vote on that language. And if you have any questions um, after this evening, before you actually have to vote on it, if you have any questions about that, feel free to send them to me. I will either ask the uh, finance department or the town engineer and get answers for your questions. That's basically what the CIP discussion was. In years past, we uh, had these broken down within a five-year plan. Um, this last page shows that all this is predicated on the 2015-2016 um, cycle. So they want to accomplish all these pieces during this year. I think that the uh, the way it was explained to me is that these items would be in the 15-16 year. That's correct. There are other items which, as you said, Mark, would be broken out of subsequent to that. Um, and I can I'll get you the, the complete um, yeah. document so you'll have that for your yeah, reference. So this is essentially different than what we received uh, when, when the capital improvement presentation. Uh, there's, there's stuff in it, but it's changed quite a bit. Then. Because right, I'm seeing stuff in here that I don't think we discussed. This, well, that's, and that's a really good point, Bob. I think, um, it, and if there are things here, and I will get you the complete thing from the town engineer yep. uh, next day or two and get that out to you so you have a chance to take a look at it. Um, my understanding is that I think last night the Board of uh, Selectmen finished up their approval of the budget um, so that they were actually going to meet before us tonight in this room, but they canceled that meeting because they finished up last night. So I assume that they at least have organized into their uh, <coughs> discussion so far some of these things, and I'll get you that information before yeah, the next meeting, too. This is just a summary. Yeah. Just the presentations detailed enough so we can quite understand it. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And just like I said, I just got this this afternoon, so uh, frankly, I don't, I don't have a lot of more information other than that either, but okay. I didn't want, didn't want you to see it early on. So, so if you, like I said, if you do have questions on it, please send them in, and I'll get answers for you as quickly as possible. The other thing I wanted to mention, too, is I sort of just, just referred to it, is that uh, previously we had talked about our budget. Um, Someone thank you for coming to the, the budget meetings. They're always a thrill for me. I just really think this time of year. I'd much rather be planning and budgeting. But I think that uh, what happened is that we figured out, uh, the Forest Life has figured out how to fund um, the major WETOG study that we've been talking about trying to finish for a couple of years. And I believe that um, if that program is funded, that we'll have some uh, really exciting things to work on in the next nine months with regard so to it. So it did get funded. There, that's my discussion so far. Now, what could happen to the Board of Finance, when the Board of Finance gets a hold of it, who knows? They yeah. may decide that it's not appropriate. Uh, we do think it's important. And if we're ever serious about getting these uh, village districts together and uh, coordinated, we, we think that's the next project that needs to be done. That, that could be really, really exciting for that, that portion of town. So we will continue to work on getting that in and uh, hopefully fund it. That's important. We're seeing a couple of other applications coming in for, uh, we have our first uh, workforce housing overlay zone application to come in for some property up near the skating center in the north end that hasn't, it's actually not a formal application yet, but they came in and talked informally to the zoning commission about that. That is in fact a zone change, so you'll see it before it goes back to zoning. So as soon as it comes in, that'll be referred to you. So that's kind of an interesting thing. That's our first workforce housing overlay zone application um, under our new regulation that we put out a year or two ago. So 20% of the housing in that particular development would be workforce housing. It used to be called affordable, but it's workforce housing now because it's not quite to the affordable level, it's a little higher. 
Oh, it has to do with the town's area median income based on that. So people like school teachers and firefighters and regular folks can afford to live there as well. 80% of those units will be market rate units. In this particular situation is kind of an interesting uh, thing, you'll, and you'll see it again, again before the Zoning Commission sees it, uh, is that it's a combination of different types of housing. So some single family, uh, some townhouses, some, uh, I think there's one apartment building. How many units are you talking I don't know yet. I don't know yet. That, that particular regulation allows up to 20 units per acre, and it's nowhere near that. It's nowhere near that. How many acres? Uh, a big piece of property. It's probably 50 acres. Not 500 units. No, no, it's 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 really not. Like it's really much smaller. I'd probably say it's probably under 100, 100 or under. It's it's a relatively small piece. Here. Not very dense. So, you still have, as you know, sitting in the north end, uh, the Meadowwood development, which is. Right. Originally 644 units. 300. What 299 doing. is where it got down to. Yeah. And that actually came back to exactly what the original property was zoned for. One per acre. No, <laughs> it's just, once again, we just okayed in the last year over a thousand, almost a thousand units. Yeah, it's like we're adding more. It's like. Well, there's a, there's a lot of things to take into account. One is the fact that they're not all going to appear tomorrow probably three to five years build out in any one of these projects and the, uh, there's also a significant uh, contribution that the market's going to play in the whole thing. So uh, each of the projects is going to be looked at individually. I'm sure that the financing institutions are going to take a look at them, look at their market studies and look at their, you know, how they're set up. So uh, I don't think that any of these projects are going to be built if there's absolutely no market. There's just no question about that. So let's see what happens. But we do have definite need for, we're still subject to 8-3G, which was what Meadowwood came in under. And as long as we're subject to that, if people want to come in and build housing, which we can help them get them in the right location, help them with design, the mix of units, those kinds of things. Whereas in the Meadowwood application, we had zero input into that, zero. So there's a, you know, do we, do we is it the best thing that we would all want? But as long as that 8-3G is still in place, we really need to say, can we provide a small amount of affordable housing and help these projects move forward? One of the things that was mentioned earlier this evening by the former applicant is that, and they feel strongly about this too, and I've talked to their marketing people about it, they feel strongly that those front parcels are actually going to begin to develop once some of the housing is built. When there are people there to buy stuff, when there are feet on the street, when there are people that, that want services, um, we're hopeful that some young professionals obviously will continue to come back to town. Uh, we think it's important that they do. One of the other things that we're seeing now, too, and you'll see an application, uh, or maybe it's just a zoning application, but there is an application coming in the next month or so for a small office building. There's a lot of, of call out there for small spaces, relatively small spaces, not big, huge buildings anymore. And so what we're starting to see is a, a couple of people are thinking about, can we build a 5,000 square foot office building or a 7,000 square foot office building and get some smaller businesses in those buildings. So we're starting to see some of that as well. And the reason we're starting to see some of that is they think that there's going to be people around that can have those that would rather work here rather than go to uh, West Hartford or to Hartford or East Hartford. So we're hopeful that that trend will continue as well. We feel comfortable that it will. But I think, that, you know, I have a lot of faith in the market and how the market's going to function. So uh, a thousand units are not going to appear tomorrow. They're just not, I don't think that's going to happen that way. <laughs> Doors and crossing springing up all at once. It is. It is. And that's a, a bit of a, um, I guess it's a bit of an unusual project. I think when we looked at the Powder Forest PAD that Landworks is doing, they were very specific about the fact that they're going to do that incrementally as well. The uh, Dorset Crossing uh, piece, that's 168 units total. Uh, some people think it's um, nice. They've, they've seen it so far. Other people think it's, um, it's, it's too much in, in, in that area. We'll just have to see how they make out with, with their... I think that my sense is that the people that, that, would, um, that would look to, to rent these in that particular area are probably going to be working more toward the Day Hill Road area, kind of the north end of town, toward the airport perhaps, something like that. 15 or 20 minutes to the airport and then come back to, to that area um, might be something that they find desirable. I think that's what they're probably finding now. I think that they had started, they wanted to get into their first building in March. Uh, I think the snow had really slowed them down. 
so I think it's probably going to be April or May before they actually get into their first building. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that goes as well. That'll be the sort of the, the uh, canary in the, in the coal mm -hmm. mine for that particular project. Speaking of Dorset Crossing, did the plans change from that original application that came in, even after <coughs> Caldro or Griffin Land decided not to play ball with them? <coughs> it seemed to me that the configuration of what was supposed to happen there has changed drastically. Um, all of those townhouses that they're building back there were supposed to be like that mid-range. You were going to have the front section, which was going to be commercial, right up by the road. And then directly behind that was supposed to be townhouses. And then farther back were going to be individual larger homes. That doesn't look like what I see there now. I see uh, a giant apartment complex mm -hmm. out in the back. Mm -hmm. Now, did they change the plans from the original the, one that was the, the, given the, to us? They changed the plan probably about three times. Agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think in the back, there was originally, if you remember, there were a, a road, a long road, that yes. an access way that went to... And it slid off in two directions. Well, there, there was a road that went on underneath the power lines, if you recall. Yeah, oh, well, so that was... Opposite so Wilcox. The first application that they came in with had a, uh, a roadway out to a series of single-family dwellings right. underneath the power lines. Ultimately, their marketing people said, we don't really think that's such a good idea. <laughs> so ultimately, that whole section of property, I think there's approximately 20 acres, 19 point something acres, maybe, is where they that became, had special needs. became open space. Okay? That was open space. <clears throat> Next to that is the 48 unit um, specialty housing for folks with MS. Eight of those units on the bottom level, or eight units somewhere in the building, are reserved for local people with special needs not just people with MS. So there'll be a combination of, of uses in there that some folks, 40 of those folks would have, a qual in order to qualify to live there, would need to be afflicted with MS in some particular way. So the MS housing is, is back there, obviously around that, that, cul that rotary, that roundabout that we looked at. Mm -hmm. The other, um, the uh, east point is called, at Dorset Crossing, is the apartment building that's there, there's no question. There are two other lots that are actually behind that behind those apartment buildings, and those we don't have any plans for yet. Ultimately, that road will go through there, uh, back around that roundabout, through there, and through the Griffin Land property, and come out over on Hoskins, ultimately. <clears throat> I guess to rephrase the question, when we approve a set of plans, and that mylar is supposedly signed off on, are there changes allowed to happen? There were changes in the site plan that happened, but there was nothing, in other words, portions that were originally uh, residential are still residential. The commercial portion toward the road where the walk-in center is is still commercial. There's still other office buildings that can go on those parcels. Yes, right. The portion that you referred to before about Griffin Land owned that, I think it was about 10 acres in the front there as you go in. Dorset well, Cross they wanted to go on create the, the intersection directly across from Wolka. They wanted to have that as a four-way intersection, and that was a right away that it's still somehow there. they weren't yeah. going to play ball, yeah. and so they had to move it down the street no. as their entranceway. But that's their driveway, essentially. That's Dorset mm -hmm. Crossing Drive, but that roadway will connect ultimately to that roundabout that was constructed. Right. They did a nice, really nice job on that, actually. And that road would go out and connect to that four-way intersection. Uh, that I guess the about. point is, is that I just remember the original plan that came in front of us really doesn't look anything like what's being constructed mm -hmm. there now. And I'm wondering if that my imagination or has they, there they been an ability to change plans? Came yeah, in here. About three times. I think we did. Oh, that was because he had to change, you know, um, there was a... Well, there was a land swap. Yeah, land swap. Right. Yeah. But, there was, there was but the configuration wasn't, in my mind, wasn't the same as we have right now. I, you know, it, it, hasn't not, it hasn't changed an awful lot, Mark. It's just not done yet. That's, you know, that's that's... No, my take. Okay. But it can't happen without, I guess that's what I'm driving to at. To come back here. Right? They can't change the layout. In other words, this one we have in front of us right here. They can't change this layout once it's approved. This layout has to stay this way. That's right. The lot lines that you just approved? Not just the lot lines, but building locations, things like that. They Build, can't change. Building locations are site plan issues. Those go to the Zoning Commission. Subdivisions and lot lines 
and original PAD approval come from the Planning Commission. It, the Zoning Commission's jurisdiction has to do with site plans. This commission doesn't deal with site plans. Okay, so then that means they do have flexibility in changing um, the location of these buildings. They've showed us these drawings tonight. They actually can change those after we have passed our approval on. After the fact, they can then change the configuration of what we just saw. Yeah, we, we've had this discussion a bunch of times, and there are some things that, as I told you, and I think I remember talking to Alan about it, there are certain things that I would be really, really strong about. The commission was really, really strong about heights of buildings, for example. Mm -hmm. Changing a residential building to a commercial building would not happen. Mm -hmm. Would not happen. Okay. Lot lines, of course, would not happen because that's under your jurisdiction as well. Um, but there are specific things that you were noted in your approval that are not going to change because we were concerned about views to the to the ridge, to the tower, and all that. Those are things that are immutable. They aren't going to change unless you change your mind on that. Just but like whether somebody commercial. moved the building ten feet or not, it's it's commercial to residential and vice versa. Yes. Both. Yeah. 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 But if they if they wanted to change those things, those uses, that would come back here. No question about that. But typical site plan issues, like I said, you know that circular parking lot or moving a building or consolidating a building from three to one, that's cycling stuff. Well, I'm not talking about small as-built. I'm talking, you know, as-built things where they're a couple feet out one way or the other. That's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at, you know, yeah. serious, uh, like Orange Dorset Cross, yeah. serious relocation of whole buildings, you know, 500 feet, 600 yeah. feet farther back than they were originally. Well, again, it's, you know, Re building relocation again is a site plan issue. It's not. It's not really. And in that case, you know, we were pretty specific about how the lot lines would be laid out. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, um, the uh, PAD once it was approved, and this that's been back. Gosh, in front of Open Space Committee, Conservation Commission. Um, the, this commission has seen a, a recent. Uh, 0.36 acres, and then behind that specialty housing is going to be deeded to the open space. Remember, we talked about that and approved that. So that's the only change that's going. That's going to go back. Of course, selectmen acted on it last night, I think, or at their last meeting. I'm not sure which. Now, they did approve that as well. It's going back to the zoning commission for that final approval. That's not going to change where any of the buildings are located or where any of the construction is located. It's simply going to take 0.36 acres and transfer that from the private owner to the town open space. So that's that's a really small change, but uh, to them it was important. So that's the kind of change that's, that's we went through five commissions to do a 0.36 acre change. Mm -hmm. Depends on the, the nature of it, the type of it. But if you have any questions about you know what got approved and what's there, feel free to come in. We're we're anxious to see some of the <coughs> structures come in as well. Yeah. But we can't we can't force it. Can I ask a question? Sure. Subdivision regulations. Sure. I looked through that today, and am I right that if it's being subdivided for residential use, that there is a threshold of 25 living units, and which requires a traffic report, which can be waived? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there a threshold for commercial development that requires, for our purposes, under subdivision? Uh, Bernie, Bernie, we talked. Remember, we talked about a, a great deal about commercial subdivisions. We had a big long discussion about that, and I don't think there's a specific requirement, Alan. I would tell you this, for though. Traffic. Yeah, for traffic. I would say this, though, that anything that's substantial with regard to either a number of buildings or any kind of substantial traffic input, um, we would ask them for some traffic. Target. No. Well, what we're looking at here. Well, again, they, they did that initially <coughs> for the the whole, the whole thing, thing initially. So they did it. So this is, is not a change in the number of units. If it was a big increase in the number of units, number one, it would have been back through the whole PAD process. But number two, we would have asked for much more detailed traffic information. It's interesting that there's no threshold for commercial. I don't know how you define that. Yeah, well, it's tough. And we talked about that a lot, you know, when we did the, the regs, the subdivision regs. And we came up with the fact that, um, you know, we're going to have to put, if you folks want to see it, for example, if it came in as a, as a subdivision with a, with a big commercial a component to what you wanted to see a traffic report, and for some reason we didn't ask for it, which I would, would tell you that we would ask for it, um, then we certainly could get that. This the, wasn't the biggest building here, like 25,000 square feet, the commercial when that originally came in? Yeah, it, well, I think they talked at one time, they talked about, 
Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods or something like that. And that's probably, you know, in the 45,000 square foot vicinity. But that's not really pinned down exactly yet. But we would look at is it, is it close to what they originally proposed in terms of the setback, in terms of the size that was proposed. I think you just scaled out. I think it's about 45, 43 to 45,000 square feet. They're marketing it as potential uses. And the biggest one I saw was 39,000. Yeah, could well be. Where we're talking to. Yeah. Could well be. I think that what happens when you get, you know, much, much beyond that area is it, it, it tends to become a market. Um, significant impact and we were probably asking for traffic on that, something like that. Big Y open yet? <laughs> Not quite yet. Not quite yet. I talked to somebody about that today actually. Um, my understanding is as soon as the snow goes away they're going to start uh, clearing. And I hope that's still the case. I can only tell you what I'm told and I believe that's to be the case. <coughs> People are starting to talk about the rest of that property and what's going to happen there. And it goes down to Sunrise, to the Sunrise uh, Market there in the corner. And so there are a couple other buildings that are there now. And I uh, hope that that old house that's there is uh, restored somehow, uh, reused, refurbished, repurposed, whatever. That could be something, a number of different things. Um, there's also some discussion about what could happen to Sunrise in terms of how that building could be made to look a bit better as well, upgrading that structure. So that could be significantly improved. We don't have any specific plans for that yet, but we're hopeful. But again, I think that once the uh, the big Y goes the, goes in there, uh, big Y is interested because they obviously have a number of apartment dwellers behind them that will be customers as well. So they're very anxious to get that moving as well. So you know, it's, it's a synergistic thing that we're hoping will will all fit together one, one piece at a time. Still, know nothing besides what we heard tonight for the town center. Uh, there are some things that I don't have formal plans for yet that will be kind of interesting. People are asking. Yes. Oh, definitely asking. No question about that. We talked to people, talked to three different people about the DOT parking lots. I've uh, talked to some people about, uh, I think there's no secret that we're talking to the Simscroft people about their particular property as well. Uh, Simscroft has come to the uh, Zoning Commission for an informal presentation to relocate their facility up to 80 Walker Road next to Pona. And so there will be a construction yard out of the center of town up to, to that area should that rezone be successful. And that's a rezone that you'll see uh, and as, soon as, as soon as they submit it as well. They had an informal discussion with the Zoning Commission with regard to um, would this be acceptable. One of the things that's really important in a situation like that is whether Phonon is a very sophisticated, precision, high-tech manufacturer would really want these things next door in terms of the smoke and the dust and the vibration and so on. And the, uh, the various owners have talked to each other, and they're, they, they've worked out whatever issues they may have had, and they're willing to, to live with each other. Um, whether that ultimately will be approved by the Zoning Commission, I can't say, but it looks pretty good at this point. So I saw this morning Mike Gerard's plan to do a weekend with the office completely hides the industrial park behind it. Yeah. This is kind of neat. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting, you know, Mike uh, has, has would move his office up there as well, that's your right. Uh, as well as the equipment, so that also then you know he has his office on uh, you know up at high school right now. So what happens to that? So that could be either repurposed into another office building, or you know really I mean that could almost be a residence the way it looks. So nice. that's nice. you know could well be somebody wants to live next to the high school, pro or con. You know if you have a lot of kids in school, you can walk to school. That's fine. If not, you know if you don't like kids, you probably wouldn't buy that house. Uh, so who knows what's going to happen there? But so lots of moving parts anyway. So we'll see what's happening. Yeah. The uh, one question, if I heard correctly last night <coughs> when they were discussing the DOT site, did I hear that the, the way I heard it, the DOT would not allow a prospective purchaser to do a contamination examination on the property? That's you have to buy it with yeah. sight unseen? Yeah, it is. Yeah, why, why, would they, why would they not do that? They, they don't allow testing on their property. They just don't allow it. Just so in case they're at fault. Whose property? <laughs> it's it's the state property. property. It's our property. Our property, yeah, you're right. We can, we can get it for zero dollars, though. <laughs> There's a, um, probably, a, I, I think, and I talked to Jeff Shea about this too, probably a number of different ways that we could determine whether there's any issues close by, you know, a property that's on the perimeter of it. We either have 
connections to where we either own the property that's on the perimeter of that. So we could do some, some testing on that as well. Um, but at this point in time, I was in a meeting with DOT and we asked them for permission to test and they just said no, no question. No discussion, as a matter of fact, just said no. So, just say $880,000. Well, of course, that's the first question. It's not going to well know. It's the first question somebody's going to ask, you know, is it clean or not? And uh, we, we, don't, we don't have a clear answer to that question. Can we stop everything? Good. So we need to uh, figure out ways to do that. And, uh, you know, they think in the old days, they had directional mooring. Exactly. Didn't they used to steal oil from that guy over there? Well, we didn't. <laughs> but that's all I got. Anything else? Thank you very much. No. Okay, thank you. We'll do a minute, Mr. Drake. I'm sure, let's get him out of the way. January uh, 13th, 2015. Um, any deletions, changes to page one? Um, line 10, a uh, small typo. I think it should be a comma after Prel. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Motion on accepting of the minutes. So moved. Seconded. Anyone? Second. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? One abstention. Myself. Thank you, gentlemen. We have a business. Do we have another motion from somebody? Move to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.